This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question, where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story, now part of the Marketing Podcast Network. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and today I'm very excited to introduce you to Delani Kahawala. Delani earned her PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard and began her career by working on extra dimensions. You heard that right, extra dimensions. That's so cool, and I can't wait to ask you more about that. She figured out pretty quickly, though, that there weren't many people who wanted to read her work as a theoretical physicist, so she began exploring new dimensions in fantasy fiction. Many of the characters in her stories are inspired by the various cultures she grew up in. Born in Sri Lanka, she has lived in New Zealand and Australia and now lives in the United States and joins me today to talk about her latest novel, Blood Moon Prophecy. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Delani. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to have you here. And Delani, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody as we begin, which is, Delani, where does your story as an author begin? Um, I really think it began... Uh way back when I was a little girl, I grew up in Sri Lanka. I grew up in, uh, my first five years were in this little village in Sri Lanka called Godigamua, which is um, just, just in my grandma's house. Uh, we lived with my grandparents and um, I still remember a lot of just the food and the smells and the culture um, that was just so different from growing up later in like New Zealand and Australia and, and then in the US. Um, now, I didn't write when I was young. I wasn't really, I didn't have any dreams of being an author when I was, you know, five or 10 or even, you know, 15, 20. Um, but I carried a lot of those memories with me when I started writing. And that comes through in a lot of the, the elements of Blood Moon Prophecy. Um, I mean, I, I think that's where it started and that's where I started like really dreaming about stories and worlds that were different from our world. Uh, but my writing journey actually started much, much later. Yeah. Well, when, when you were growing up, I mean, if you didn't have dreams of becoming a writer, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah, well, I think my earliest memory of wanting to be something when I grew up was maybe when I was about seven or six or seven, I wanted to be an astronomer, which then um, I think was just sparked by sort of TV shows and books at the time around you know planets and space exploration. And I think that later grew into wanting to be an astronaut. Um, and then so at some point I realized that was actually pretty tough to do, especially if you don't live in the U.S., <laughs> Um, and the, and the, you have to, you have to be a very good swimmer and I, and I'm not a very good swimmer. Um, but you know, despite that, um, after I went to college, that kind of morphed into, um, just a love of physics and, and theoretical yeah. physics, which I kind of pursued through college and then into my grad school studies. Yeah. So, um, you know, you mentioned wanting to be sort of an astronomer, um, what you know, and you mentioned like TV shows and stuff were like were like kind of influencing that. What like what were you watching? Like why why were you sort of drawn to kind of what was going on like way up there? Yeah, the, I remember very distinctly the TV shows that were on around the time. There were these. Um, there was Star Trek was always on TV. I think that's next generation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was like a massive fan of it, but it was always on TV. Babylon Five was on TV, so there were a ton of these like ninety space movies and, and TV shows on, and I think um, that just probably had an influence on me. And I just thought everybody else was thinking about you know wanting to be a doctor or a lawyer, and I just thought oh, I just want to do something really, really different and cool and think about really crazy, strange things. And I think that's just been a, been a theme <laughs> throughout. Yeah. 
And so then you, I mean, you go on to, you know, you mentioned like becoming an astronaut's very difficult. I imagine earning a doctorate in theoretical physics is no small feat either, you know? Well, it, 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 it definitely wasn't. Um, I think as an astronaut, I, there's, you know, there's like five of them. And at some point I realized oh, I'd have to go to the U.S. and I'd have to figure out like I wasn't a U.S. citizen and all those things were just like in my way. Um, and, and over time, I became really interested in just the fundamentals of how our universe worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it definitely was difficult, the PhD, doing a PhD um, and just working on problems where you don't really know if there is an answer or you're going to find one. You kind of go at these problems again and again and, and you work work at it. Um but it was at the same time it was probably like a one of the most amazing experiences i had and yeah. you know i would do it again even though i'm not uh, a physicist anymore so what is the the title of your doctoral dissertation it's uh topics in uh large hadron collider physics um and so what I work, the thing is when you, when you do grad school and you're at that level of physics, you end up working on very, very narrow slices of, of physics. So, and it, it tends to get fairly esoteric. Um, so what I was working on, uh, there's something called the Large Hadron Collider, and it's this massive, massive particle accelerator uh, the largest in the world, and it's um, in Switzerland. And uh, it, they use it to basically smash these fundamental particles together and create new ones. Um, and I was basically working on figuring out, I didn't work on the experiment itself. I was a theoretical physicist. So we were trying to work out what kind of things might they see there that fit all the data and the other you know theories that we have around Um, and by this time, the problem is very constrained. We've looked at all the options out there and there aren't that many like new particles to be discovered. Uh, but the hope was that as you collide these particles higher and higher and higher energy, they will produce something and some evidence of things that we haven't seen yet. So that sounds actually really interesting. Um, but you chose to kind of move away from that. It sounds like, and, and start writing. So, so you don't consider yourself a theoretical physicist anymore? No. So after, uh, I think, so my PhD was about five years and somewhere, um, along that time, um, I was at Harvard, which was kind of in the center of this very academic, interesting place, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and there's this it's not Silicon Valley, but there's quite a bit of startup culture going on. And that's not something I had been exposed to when I was growing up. Um, and suddenly I felt like all around me at Harvard, MIT, all these other universities, there were this interesting buzz of activity around tech, um, which frankly kind of moved so much faster than uh, like in physics. I would write a paper or start working on that paper. And then by the time it was done, it was like a year and a half minimum. Um, And I was often working on it with me or just maybe one other person. And what was happening out there in tech just seemed to be much more sort of collaborative and fast and exciting. And you get to kind of see the, see the results of what you do much, much quicker. And so I think I, uh, I felt like I had done my tour of duty and then just wanted to try something that was moving really fast. I did a little bit of consulting just because my background was very technical and needed to be rounded out and ended up in tech. And that's where I've been. Um, and writing is just, just my side hobby. I'm not a, I don't know if I would call myself a full author, but, um, but I, I transitioned away from physics um, into tech over time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always curious, like what brings, you know, writers from other careers to trying writing? Um, yeah. You know, I, I interview a lot of people on the show. And it, interestingly, there's a lot of lawyers who sort of, you know, while they're doing their lawyer thing, uh, they start writing. And, uh, you know, I've interviewed a few people who were able to sort of hang up their, you know, 
law practice in and write full time, which I think is uh, was is pretty cool. And I've talked to other people too, you know, tech people. I mean, most most of the authors that I talk to, they they all have day jobs as well. Um, but what can you tell me about uh, about this book? Um, I know we don't want to give too too much away, but um, you know, what can you share uh, with us about Blood Moon Prophecy? Yeah. Um... So the, the story is about Tilly Nix. She's this 16 year old living in New York. Um, she knows there's something funny about her past, but that really uh, comes to a head when this stranger comes into town and, and, and wants to reach her, but doesn't get the chance to. So he, he befalls an accident um, and she gets to know about it and it turns her world upside down. And she realizes that she's from this other place um, and that something about her family's history uh, means that she has to go to this world called Maria and <clears throat> basically fulfill uh, her mother's wishes um, and and when she gets there it's a it's a tough journey for her because things happened in her past around her, her mother dying and um, her village getting destroyed that that leave her really scarred and she doesn't tell anyone about this story and it comes out over time but she goes into this world which is an ocean world where people live on ships and boats and there's very few sort of like big countries um, and there's magic of like elemental magic and she has to really solve a mystery that is thousands of years old uh, that has been running through her family for generations and generations to figure out why she had the center of it and what is at the end of this journey. Um, and along the way, she discovers, she meets these people who actually become her, her family when she never really had one before. And so it's a very kind of classic found family uh, theme running th throughout. Very cool. And so when did you, uh, when did you start writing this? I started writing this in 2014. So, so you know, like eight, eight years ago now. Um, I, I write, started when I was um, living in New York. I was living on the Upper West Side and working in Brooklyn. Um, and sort of on my way back and forth, I would, I would really, I wasn't really a writer. I would dream about stories. Um, and writing was just, I had to learn how to write to get the stories out. Um, and that's really, really how it started. And a lot I mean, of the could... early, yeah. Go... Go ahead. A, a lot of the early part of the book is actually set very much where I used to live around that area of New York. That's cool. I mean, I, I imagine, you know, writing in, in academia and I've done some of that myself um, is completely different than writing in, you know, writing for writing for fiction, because, you know, you're, you it's almost like less is more, you know, like, you, you, you know, you have to learn how to edit yourself better. Whereas I know in academia, it's, um, you know, it, what's the expression it has to feel like an A, right? It's got, it's got to feel meaty. But um, what lessons did you learn about yourself while going through this process? I mean, starting in 2014, and sort of now it's, it's, what year are we in 2022? Um, well, what did you learn about yourself over that time? Yeah, I um, so many things. I I learned that I actually enjoyed the writing part of it, um, but it took me a while to get good at it. I had to learn like how does like dialogue come together? How does do descriptions work? How do you bring a story and construct it um, so that it all kind of all the threads come together? Um, but what I found interestingly and what kept me going for so long is um, writing was just this like almost sacred time in my day where I could just really just focus on that and truly kind of escape from the work and all the other things that are going on. And, you know, I would always start writing at like 1030 at night or 11 at night and go till like one in the morning or something. And those hours were just like the most precious hours of my day. And yeah. so that, that's something I decided, discovered that I loved writing and I discovered that I had more perseverance than I, than I ever would have thought to edit the, and re rewrite this book again and again. Yeah. So what was, what was your path to publishing it? Did you go the traditional route where you queried agents? Uh, did you self-publish? Did you hybrid? What was the, what was your path? 
Um, it was self-published. Um, I did query agents early on in the process but honestly the book was very different when I when I did that and um to me self-publishing just so I published it on the under Cedar Street Press which is sort of my own uh publishing imprint I suppose um I had help with it in the sense that I didn't do like I had a lot of editing done that was professionally edited professionally laid out um with a professional cover and all of that um, so it wasn't like I did all of that on my own, um, but I thought it just gave me the ability to bring a story that is still very well edited and, and written to an audience in the way that I that I wanted. Um, you know, I, I don't wasn't ever really against traditional publishing or anything like that, but this just gave me flexibility. I was I'm working at the time, so I couldn't see myself sort of suddenly becoming a, a, a full-time author traditionally published uh, and this was like I, I just want to get this book out I want to talk to as many people and get the word out as possible um, and really kind of talk about the story in, in the way that I wanted yeah and you know it's you know when you when you're working a full-time job and you're trying to publish a book it that becomes a full-time job you know just trying it definitely to find- does you know, trying to find, you know, representation can be a full-time job. And then from there, you know, it's, uh, the agent has to probably, you know, uh, have their comments, right. And you're going to go through a rewriting process. And then you know, fortunately, if you're, if, if you're fortunate, it sells to a publisher and the process begins again. And yeah. next thing you know, you're a year or two years, you know, after exactly. finding your agent. Um, so a lot of people are like, Hey, I could just do this myself with, with help. Yeah. Um, and you know, exactly. that's why the, the publishing yeah. industry is changing, you know, so much with, um, yeah, the, the timelines are definitely when I, when, you know, I have a friend, I have a couple of friends who've published and they've definitely walked me through what, what, do, what do these timelines look like from the moment you start pitching and I'm like, oh man, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a process. Um, having said that though, I, I had gone through, I think four rounds of editing for this book. So definitely by the end of it, I was like, okay, I think this is done and ready now. There, there yeah. isn't any more that I could refine. So I felt like I went through that anyway. And then I like, I didn't want to necessarily do another two years of it. Yeah. Hey, you're doing, you're doing it on your terms. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, what has the reception been so far? Have your, have your coworkers read the book? Has anyone given uh, a They have. They, a few of them have. Um, I think everybody was surprised because I didn't, I've had talked to a few, pe- few people that are about writing. Um, and they were always like, you were doing what now? Um, uh, and so I announced it to all my family and friends on like Instagram and, and so on. And people were just, one, I was just incredibly surprised by how like kind and, and supportive and excited people were. Um, but also just, they were like, they were surprised. I I, yeah. I don't think writing books is thing a thing that people really do any maybe anymore. Um, but overall, the reception has been really great. There's been um, people have had uh, have picked up on all the things that I thought was special about the book. And so, in the reviews that I see, that comes through like the found family, and it's a very very unique world. So that's been really really heartening. Yeah. And is there a second book in uh, in you? Are you thinking about a, another book? Uh, so it it is part of a series, um, and this is the and I, and I almost probably tried to squeeze a little too much into this one book, but I wanted readers to kind of have that like full experience. There's definitely um, several books in the series. I just have to find time to write it. The write the second one now. Um, yeah. It, it ends on a little bit of a, a little bit of a cliffhanger. So um, ho- hoping I can get to it soon. And I imagine, you know, having written the first one um, and kind of going through this process, you know, and, and this is my experience as well. Like the, the follow-ups are typically a little bit more efficient because you've learned so much about the process the first time around. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not learning as much and, and also you're not making as many mistakes, which of course right. happened along the way too. I really hope so because I, I don't want the next one to take eight years. But I've learned, I think, all the learnings around like the mechanics of it and 
and and how you get the book published and and figured out um i i know now i think most of the time can go towards just like refining the story and and getting the characters spot on so hopefully it goes much faster yeah yeah no i'm i'm sure it will um, well, I always like to uh, ask my uh, guests a series of questions uh, to get them to get to know them just a little bit more. Uh, one we already touched upon, but we can uh, kind of go back to it, which is when you were growing up, what were some of your favorite TV shows? What were you watching and paying attention to on TV? Yeah, one of my um, one of the shows that I liked the most when I was like six or seven was The Flash. I think there was a 90s version of The Flash. Uh, which I'm sure is very deep in people's memories and, and, and people don't even know what I'm talking about. But it used to be one of the shows that I regularly, regularly watched. Um, so I, I grew up in Sri Lanka. So only a subset of what is available to an American audience makes it there. Yeah. Um, so I, I watched The Flash. I watched a lot of movies like The Lion King and, and all of that. And these stories were really like Disney was just like mind blowing to me. Um, and it probably had a lot to do with um, stories and, and just being really inspired to write amazing stories. Um, and the other show I have to say is Knight Rider. I don't know if you wrote Oh, those. that's a classic. Oh, yeah. of course. I, I mean, I grew up with Knight Rider. That was that debuted when I was like five years old. Yeah. So it's I was it's, prime Knight Rider age. I. I just, I was probably watching like reruns or I didn't really even have like the cultural context around it, but I just really liked the show. So those are probably the two that I remember the most. I, you know what I love about that fact is I, I'm pretty sure it took place in like Southern California. Um, but he was always wearing a, like a leather jacket um, and maybe even leather pants or, or jeans. Yeah. And like, <laughs> it must have been boiling hot. Boiling in that outfit. hot, yeah. Yeah, it's it it just didn't really resemble reality much, but that was that was like the best part of it, honestly. Right. Now, did you think when you when you know you came to the states for the first time, did you expect to see, you know, a bunch of men in leather jackets because of that, or were you um, disappointed that the cars didn't talk? Well, when I I I had I moved to New Zealand when I was about ten, so I had this like next stage of my life sort of growing up in western countries so that was a little bit sort of muted expectations of what when i came to the us um i came to the us when i was like 21 um and and the shocking things were more like you know like different words and like the way people you know it's called a elevator instead of a lift and and yeah. things like that and just portion sizes were huge in America, and just like it's ridiculous. cultural, like cultural, the U.S. really has this sense of, hey, anyone can really go try anything and 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 make it happen. That's really very obvious. Um, especially where I lived, I lived on the coast, um, and, and so that that was the most surprising thing to me. Yeah. What about music? What were you listening to when you were growing up? Um. Probably. I, I don't have a lot of like very vivid memories of music, probably whatever my dad was playing on, on like those uh, cassette tapes. Uh, I remember uh, uh, the one that I distinctly remember was a little bit later on. Um, Wigfield had the song called Saturday night. And I remember this like song being stuck in my head for like years and years and years uh and and so just like standard pop music and whatever my dad was listening to really but that's what that's <laughs> that song i remember yeah um you're kind of going through you know taking eight years to to write um the book what um what if any lessons did you feel like you learned the hard way during that time period yeah so so many lessons um i think the Hardest one was um, how much the characters matter. Um, I remember first writing like the first version of the book and um, I, I didn't really understand what character, like writing a character meant. 
And when I read it again, I just felt like these characters were flat and I had to figure out how to make them distinct and more interesting and have their own personality. And actually having the eight years to spend with the characters helped me figure out, well, who is this person and who, what are their dreams and aspirations? And who is this person and what are, what are their dreams and aspirations that is different and what do they bring to the story? Um, that I think was, was what I had to work on the most. I have a very natural tendency to kind of be plot driven. So I felt like the plot kind of came to me more easily. Uh, but just working on the characters again and again and again until I felt like I had very distinct and colorful people in the story. Yeah. You have to, you know, you, you got to make them memorable, right? Or, yeah. Um, right. and then you have to, you have to do it in such a way that people feel empathy for them because they, that's going to keep them caring about, about them and caring about the story overall. It's, and, and that's like, that was actually really hard because I, I wanted to write like Tilly, for example, she's 16. So she has her 16 year old, you know, side of her personality um, so I didn't want to hide that necessarily. Um, and so that balance of like, how do you show really like, this is like a real person and hopefully that makes them more, more three dimensional. Um, but you know, they're, they're not perfect characters for sure. Yeah. And then if you could, um, write a letter to your younger self, um, and I mean, you're a, you're a, a very smart person. You could probably figure out time travel, but if you could write a letter to your younger self and then deliver it to your younger self, what, what would you, what kind of advice would you give, you know, the younger Delani? Yeah, I think I would just say, um, just don't overthink things and give it a go. I think, um, I, I think we, growing up, you prepare so much in life for like your degree and your university experience and your career um but one of the things I learned when I came to the U.S. and, and seeing like people who found companies and things like that you just kind of have to go for it and you don't know everything and that's very uncomfortable but the more chances you get to have a go the 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 better you you know become at just taking risks and making things work so I would just tell my younger self just take as many chances to go for things um new, new things go. yeah yeah so th those are the end of my uh serious questions um if you could even consider them serious but I need to know since you're um uh you know a theoretical physicist is time travel possible can you know will we one day be able to travel through time hmm I think theoretically there are there are possibilities but and and I would like to to hold on to the possibility that we could do it but at the same time it's a little scary it's it's I'm like I don't I don't really wouldn't change that much about how my life you know turned out um so possible but I think it will be very 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 hard that's right. I mean, I'm sure a lot of bad things could come from that. Yeah. And <laughs> a lot of bad things. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, the, the whole, what if you met your own parents situation, um, back to the future style. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> then we get to it. The back to the future conundrum. Um, well, uh, Delaney, where can people buy blood moon prophecy? Yeah, um, so it's available on Amazon as an ebook or um, a paperback or hardcover. That's probably the easiest way to get it. Um, you can also get it in various other booksellers um, through Habit Distribution through Ingram Spark. Um, might be a little tiny difficult to get it in physical bookstores just yet, but hopefully one day. But I would point you to Amazon for now. Yeah, well, if you're in uh, Ingram Spark, um, then people can go to uh, really any bookstore. But I always say, go to your local independent bookstores, and they can just ask for it, and they can they can just it. ask for it exactly. Yeah. So that is great. And then uh, Delani, if people want to get in touch with you, do you have a, a website or social media you want to share with everybody? Yeah, I'm on. Um, I'm Delani Writes, and so my website is DelaniWrites.com, um, and there's a bunch of information about the book and myself. 
Um, I also have, I'm on, on Instagram and TikTok as Delani writes, so pretty easy to find. Well, I haven't been able to uh, figure out TikTok for myself yet. Um, but I think I missed the age cut. You know, I think I'm just a little bit too high or older, maybe. My kids all over it. I can't figure it out for the life of me. It's dangerous, honestly. It's like, <laughs> yeah, well, it might be a good thing that you 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 haven't yet. It's uh, it's very, very dangerous. It's like time sink. I know, I know. But it does help people, you know, sell books. So that's... Uh... That's a good there thing. is a massive book talk community, so for sure. Yeah. Well, Delani, thank you so much for stopping by and letting me uncork your story. Oh, you're welcome, and thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.